I don't know why they always have these things set for adults. Well, I am grateful to Dr. Morris for the invitation and this opportunity to be with you. And I'm being overwhelmed by the programs uh, going on and what's going on in this building. Not only eating, but exercising. I would feel guilty about that over there, but I am uh, myself a six-mile runner. I don't run it every day. And I don't run it all at once. <laughs> That's what I've accumulated over 11 years. <laughs> I am grateful for the invitation. There's not much, uh, not much of a market for old retired uh, seminary professors. We have the reputation of being about as exciting as an okra sandwich. But some people are kind to us and invite us to come, and I'm grateful. And look forward also to the worship this evening at St. John's. I want to talk about prayer during that service. Uh, I am, uh, several people have asked me where I am. I've retired several times. I can't figure out how you do it. So I'm in my third retirement. I live up where Tennessee and North Carolina and Georgia meet in the Southern Appalachians. Uh, they meet every morning for breakfast and I live right there. I am the center of, I am the director of a center uh, that works with the poor. We work with the extremely poor. And we work through the Head Start program. 90% of children in Head Start are uh, at or below poverty line, and we are trying to develop programs that enlarge and improve the self-esteem of the poor. We feel like some way to break the cycle, anything to break the cycle of dependence on others financially, hand, hand out, being on the dole, and everything has been tried. What we're doing is providing music and art and stories for children. We have added exercise. Uh, we tried to call it dance, and it didn't go over with some of the churches there that we were teaching dancing. So it's rhythmic motion. Uh, but we were encouraged to do it uh, by the Head Start program because of the obesity of children now. So we have included that in the program. And it's freestanding. We raise money. We beg, borrow, steal, embezzle, whatever we can do to get the money. And we have eight trained and professional musicians and storytellers who go to the Head Starts uh, in North Georgia, Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee. And we reach 1,200 three- and four-year-olds every week. Uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm in the same thing you're in. Just at a diff different approach and a different level, but same definition. And that is, we are trying to create a community of health. A healthy community where it is good to live and to raise a family. Where it's a good place to be sick. It's a good place to get old. It's a good place to die. A healthy community. And I'm glad the clergy are here because... We've got to figure out ways to maximize the one great advantage we have over all other professionals. And that is we have congregations. Uh, doctors have their patients and lawyers have their clients and merchants have their customers. But a pastor has a congregation. A community already formed that can be with proper education and nurture can be a healthy place for everybody. I've been going to some big meetings since uh, I retired. Uh, mostly have been meetings between clergy and physicians. Uh, one in Atlanta, one in Kansas City, and in George Washington University Hospital in uh, Washington, D.C. 
And I've heard some big talk and some interesting things. And I want to share two or three observations from those meetings. I know this is a clergy meeting. I understand there's also a meeting of physicians sometime. These that I've attended, the two were together. My first observation is this. The doctors are talking. Doctors didn't always talk. Now, Dr. Edmund uh, Pellegrino, Georgetown University Hospital, I heard him say, I think about 15 years ago, that the greatest single advance in the practice of medicine in the last 50 years is the doctors now talk to the patients. And that is a, that is a big jump. Part of the mystique of the doctor was wrapped in the silence. Everybody asked, when you get back or one of your family members gets back from seeing the doctor, the question's always, what did the doctor say? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. I know the doctors that cared for my family, which I was born and raised up the road here at Humboldt. We lived out in the country and doctors would usually come uh, rather slowly way out in the country. Usually the patient had died. Uh, when they got there, or before they got there. But I remember Dr. Penn and Dr. Osler, Dr. Spangler and Dr. Williams. Never heard any of them say anything. Dr. Williams took out my tonsils. And I noticed that he would hum. He never said anything, but he hummed blessed assurance all the time. <laughs> I didn't know how bad off I was. <laughs> Dr. Hummin, blessed assurance. But they never said anything. But now the doctors talk, and that's one of the things we enjoy about our physicians uh, down home is they, they talk to us. Uh, I was invited about three weeks ago to spend the day with the doctors at neonatal care at Emory Hospital, well, Crawford Long Hospital, part of the complex, Spent the day with these doctors in neonatal care, and the whole assignment for me, they were together three days. How do you talk to families, to patients, to interested persons? And uh, they came together. They were given assignments about a condition of a child in neonatal care. They had 10 minutes to prepare. They could not use overhead projectors any kind of technology, any kind of extra equipment, no PowerPoints, just say to the family and friends, here's the situation with your child. And it was an extraordinary thing. It just grew tongue-tied. These brilliant doctors, but how do you just say it? And brought home again the truth that I have encountered in myself and others and that is talking about something serious is about as difficult thing as you can do. Well, the doctors are talking, and the doctors are talking with the clergy. Now, there was a time when medicine and uh, religion were all the same. Before Hippocrates, it was all the same. If you had an ache or a pain or an illness of some sort, you went and offered a sacrifice at the idol or offered up some prayers at the temple, whatever, to take care of the problem. He separated the two and made medicine a matter of observation and reasoning and connecting lines of cause and effect and made, rendered a great service to medicine and to religion. But the doctors and the clergy are talking now. Now, in order to talk, you've got to have enough in common to be able to talk. And they have a lot in common, both well-educated, both highly regarded in the community until they demonstrate otherwise. Both are dedicated to the care of people. Both operate with a very strong and clear code of ethics. They're both professionals. They have enough to talk about, but also to have a good conversation. There has to be enough difference that you need to talk. And that difference is there. Now it's not totally gone. This separation is not total of course. You know that as well as I do. 
In Judaism, for instance, religion was concerned with matters of health and physical care. Judaism, if you know anything about your Old Testament alone, you have evidences of concern about handling certain diseases by quarantine. They handled a lot of things by how do you get rid of the human waste to avoid the infections. Had strict regulations about everybody taking time to rest. Had a lot of concern about diet. What you eat, when you eat, how much you eat is all a part of religion in Judaism. And it's not too far away from Christianity. Jesus was concerned, as we know from the Gospels, with mental conditions, a man living in the tombs, naked as a jaybird, screaming at night. Everybody wanted to get rid of him. He had mental disorder, spiritual disorder. The woman came and washed Jesus' feet, dried his feet with her hair. She was a woman of the night, a woman of the city. Jesus ministered to her. Physical conditions. But I noticed Luke who writes most about it. Luke, who was himself a physician and a minister, used the same word to talk about the work of Jesus when he was talking about handling mental condition, physical condition, spiritual condition. The same word was used concerning his administration. It's sometimes translated saved. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. What is the word whenever it involves the body? Your faith has saved you. When it involves mental disorder, saved you. The word means made well again, made whole again, made complete again. And Luke, the doctor, uses the same word of that kind of completeness of a person's life by the ministry of Jesus. The early church was very concerned about getting rid of superstitions, and there were many. For instance, in Matthew's gospel, He talks about how many epileptics came to Jesus. The word translated epileptic in the Greek language is selenes. Selenes. If you put that over into Latin, it's called lunatic. It simply means somebody who's been struck by the moon. Explain this condition by a certain relationship to the moon. And Jesus dealt with that matter. The early church was concerned about hospitality, but hospitality got sticky and still gets sticky if you think about the implications of hospitality when those you take care of in your home become ill or they arrive at your house and you give them hospitality and they're already ill. Now what do you do? Out of hospitality comes hospice and hostel and hospital And all of it grows out of the church's concern for this. So I don't want to give Hippocrates the credit of totally separating them. They cannot be. The conversation goes on and it is increasing all the time. I'm struck by the fact that in many seminaries there's team teaching between PhDs and MDs. Team teaching. Students are put through, sometimes against their own will, rigorous clinical pastoral education programs, getting acquainted with other caregivers in the community. The conversation is getting thicker in med schools. I noticed that over two-thirds of all medical schools have courses in religion and spirituality. Over two-thirds of the medical schools. That's extraordinary. On a local level, the parish nurse. Up in North Georgia where I live, there are 35 parish nurses sent out with their healing arts from the church. In the area of public health and other areas, uh, it's just extraordinary, the contact. And it is increasing. But the observation I want to make at this point is that among a lot of clergy... There's not much talk. So much of the talk is initiated by the doctor, medical doctor, and it is not embraced gladly by a lot of the clergy. And I've been trying to figure that out. When I went to George Washington University in Washington for that conference of medicine and 
faith or faith in medicine, whatever it was. All kinds of medicine people were there. Not many faith people were there. The invitation was to Muslim, Jewish, and Christian leaders, deans of seminary, all kinds of things like that. And I mean, you could count us on one hand. And doctors were around there just uh, thick as fleas. And uh, why the imbalance? Well, said the director, we've had difficulty getting the clergy to respond. I said, I would have thought they said, well, finally. No, 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 no. So I've been trying to figure that out. Maybe you already know why the clergy haven't responded to this new openness in the relationship of faith and healing, uh, medicine and health, whatever you want to call it. I think I have one or two guesses. These are just guesses, although my students know that my guesses are sort of equal to ultimate truth. Uh, one, one guess is this. Uh, I think many of us, it's true up in the mountains of North Georgia where I live, that there still is the idea of what was called in the 60s and 70s, God of the gaps. The gaps in knowledge, in uh, philosophy, and science, and medicine, Wherever the gaps are, we can insert religion. Ah, they don't know. They don't know. It's religion. It's spirituality. It is God. It is faith. But then when they make a discovery, it shrinks our territory. And the more they know, the less we get to brag about. And I use the areas of ignorance to insert God. And they go along here and come up with an idea, and then it becomes proven truth, and then it becomes a medicine or a practice, and there goes my little mystery. The more we know, the less we believe. These guys are not on our team. That's common to some of the ministers in the mountains. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Ministers in my area like to do things like this. You know, she went to Dr. So-and-so, and and he told her she probably had six months. That was five years ago. (laughs) You know. (laughs) Instead of celebrating, it's uh, kick them in the groin they didn't know. Uh. There's a lot of work needs to be done on that attitude. Uh, I'm not here to do it today, but you can work it out among yourselves. It's just an unhealthy uh, viewpoint. One of the things I think at work is uh, a, a strong theological objection to direct correlations between somebody's circumstance or physical condition and their faith. You know, Job's friends came to him and said, What sin have you committed that you're sitting here with sores all over your body? Sin equals disease. Disease equals sin. They are invariably connected. And that direct correlation under all circumstances, the person who is healthy, wealthy, and wise is therefore a person of faith. Ministers are a little nervous about that. Now, I know some on television tie it together with great response, huge response. And I heard a woman say on television, uh, she was in Dallas and she was giving her testimony and she said, my husband and I were just bumping along on 80,000 a year and... uh, we just turned it over to Jesus, and last year we cleared 135,000. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> and ministers are nervous about that direct correlation, just as we were back 25 years ago when their signs appeared on the highway. Do you want to fight communism? Go to church Sunday. Tying things together that don't fit too carefully, a sort of utilitarian approach to faith. Here's the way to get it. Here's the way to get it. Here's the way to get it. 
Uh, 50, 60 years ago, this country had a very large stream of belief in what's called the gospel of wealth. The gospel of wealth. God will reward you if your spirit is right. God will reward you with more money. As Andrew Carnegie said, I go to church regular. God gave me my money. A bishop, an outstanding bishop in this country, bought into that. And he said, godliness is in league with riches. If you will show me a poor man, I will show you a sinner. Now you see the nervousness here? There was the gospel of democracy, fight communism, go to church, go to church, fights communism. There's the gospel of wealth. Godliness is in league with riches. Show me a poor man, I'll show you a sinner. Now there's the possibility of a gospel of health. As the sign said on the front of this beauty salon in Atlanta, you can have the figure that Jesus wants you to have. I'm telling you the truth. I didn't come all the way here to make that up. <laughs> Churches have had Tuesday night meetings to pray away fat. Didn't want to get on those machines. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a good bit concerned, actually concerned, that we... Uh, Think of the relationship between your faith and your health in a more complex, more profound, and more meaningful way. It is one thing to have the description of health and a deep spiritual faith, spiritual life, and then to prescribe it and say it always works, it always works, it always works. That, that, that is a little bit frightening to me. The difference between description and prescription. And the reason it bothers me is we're in such a consumer society. Medicine and doctors and all I use to improve my body, what, for health? No, for appearance. I use my religion for what? I want a religion that'll help me feel this and feel that and feel something else. And it's a consumer attitude. And I hate for both medicine and faith to get caught up in the consumer ravenous appetite. And it has to be broken somehow or another. Everybody I have heard and read representing medicine, I think probably the most prolific writer is Harold Koenig over at Duke, but I've read a lot of the books and there is no question, and there is no question in my mind, that there is a direct relationship between the spirit and the body, the whole person. But then to sort of build in guarantees or make hay out of that or make money out of that is very disturbing and very consumeristic. I remember hearing Harold Koenig, who, who is strong in the connection, strong in the connection, said we must be careful to remember that the proper exercise of faith is our relationship to God, not for things we're going to get for it. And here's a man who has done studies on the relationship between attendance at church and blood pressure. And he does all these field studies and writes about them and all like that. But he says, watch it, watch it, watch it. Because what is a gift of a relationship to God can, can become, for some people's mentality, can become a kind of commodity, and then you can get on television and radio and in the papers and sell it. There's a difference, a big difference. I think uh, since we're gathered as clergy, I might mention some things that the clergy might do in response to all this. I regret in some areas the sort of a, 
I'm not ready to talk mentality among some clergy. And the hesitations, I think, are understandable for theological reasons, if for nothing else. But I would like to suggest that we maximize what is available to us. For instance, training in ethics. I don't know how much training there is in the medical school in the area of ethics. But clergy could generate in every community conversations on ethical issues. Let me just take one about which I know very little, the others absolutely nothing. One is the matter of uh, relieving pain. A friend of mine is now retired from MD Anderson in Houston, Stratton Hill, has become, he's an oncologist, he's become an expert on pain and relieving pain. And he travels all over the world talking to any kind of group that will listen about relieving pain. I said, well, at least you get a good ear from the clergy. And he said, I get a negative ear from a lot of clergy. I said, why? A lot of them say, well, that pain is necessary to purify the soul. Don't give that painkiller. Pain is necessary for spiritual growth. Pain is a way of getting yourself distanced from your body so you'll be ready for the hereafter. I said, you are kidding me. He said, that's what I hear. Don't give her that medicine to relieve her pain. She might get addicted. She's 107. Who cares? <laughs> but he said he runs into it legally and he runs to it, into it religiously. I think a discussion between clergy and doctors on the matter of the ethic of relieving pain would be more helpful than we might think right now. Because a lot of people have a hesitation about relieving or being relieved of pain because maybe God is putting me through the fire to get me ready for the hereafter or something like that. It could be discussed at length. Something else I think ministers can lead in doing, and that is helping to provide rituals. Rituals of health, rituals of sickness, Rituals of getting well, rituals of dying. We, especially Protestants, have underestimated the value of rituals. Certain predictability in the movement from this point to that point and rites of passage from this point to that point, just amazingly helpful to everybody, not just in this field, but any field. But we put it down, put it down. Oh, no, oh, no, we just preach the word. Those rituals could be provided for the whole community of healing and health. I notice you have a workshop related to that, and I was pleased to hear. And I say that by somebody who lived out his pastoral experience and taught in seminary and never was involved in that except in a peripheral way. I have come to appreciate very much its vitality. Something else I think we can do is to take advantage, that's a rough way to put it, but okay, take advantage. Take advantage of the fact that pastors are leaders of communities that are already formed and shaped with a lot of assumptions about caring for each other, being here for each other, being able to talk to each other, being able to heal and support each other. But it just doesn't happen in many churches. The pressure to become larger and larger and larger and larger and just the assimilation of members. Nobody seems to ask, do you know what it is to be a member of the church? Are you sure you want to do this? This is what we do. This is the way we talk. This is the way we relate to each other. Now, do you want to do that? Most churches turn it over to the minister. And the minister allows it to happen. Goes away to a seminar on health and religion and comes back and fusses at the people. What's the matter, you people? Don't know about this. Goes away to a seminar on social change. How to be active in your community to bring about social and political change. Who goes? The minister. Comes home, fusses at the people for sitting there and not doing anything. It's a frustrating thing. Why not take some folk with you? Instead of the minister going alone 
minister acting like I have no congregation except I have an audience on Sunday, but I don't have a congregation. To build actually congregations where people provide a healthy place to live, raise kids, be sick, get old, die, and be buried. What a wonderful place this is to be. But that's a heritage of the church that is not claimed by most churches. Uh, when we lived in Oklahoma, I was the teacher of a Sunday school class for years. It was called the Young Adults. <laughs> you know how that goes. Everybody that could walk or, you know. <laughs> well, it was a nice group of folk, about 30 or 35. One of the members, one of the members on a Friday afternoon received the phone call that her mother had been in a wreck and was killed immediately. But this member, whose mother was killed immediately, also had a child, a little girl, seven years old, in the same car, and she was badly hurt. She was immediately taken to a good hospital. Her brain was swollen. They had to drain fluid from her brain. They were trying to get the brain to shrink, come back down. It was life or death, and will she have permanent effects? All like that. Mother dead, daughter Critical, critical, critical condition. It happened on Friday, Friday afternoon. Sunday morning, here she was. Marilyn was in the Sunday school class. Now, these people in that Sunday school class had been together for years. And you know what most of them said to Marilyn? Marilyn, what are you doing here? And she said, where am I supposed to be? Have you ever noticed that the very things that should draw people to the community of faith are considered legitimate reasons for absenting yourself? Whatever happened to Jim? Well, you know, he lost his job. He's been kind of depressed. Oh, well, I understand why he didn't come. <laughs> well, whatever happened to Tiffany... And George, they used to be very regular. You know, they've been having some tensions in their marriage. Oh, well, you wouldn't want to be in church. Have you noticed this? Here is this extraordinary community with all the resources for healing and helping and talking to each other. And the minister's just kind of butting his head against the wall. We ought to do more and we ought to do more. I don't have an answer except there is one for the church to become the church. I think some of us are going to have to swallow our pride and not measure our ministry by how size, what size the church is and have we been upwardly mobile in terms of salary and all that. Have we really created a healthy place to live and be sick and die? I Wonderful, wonderful goal for any, any church. I remember on one occasion, uh, Jesus dealt with a woman's problem. It was moral. And he dealt with her and dealt with it and said, go in peace. Wonderful expression. But where was she going to go? She was a streetwalker. Go in peace. Where? Back to the street? No. Back to the family that's thrown her out? Where's she going to go? That expression, go in peace, cries out for a church. There's somewhere you can go. You'll be accepted, assimilated, talk it through, and who knows what will happen. You see it in a few cases. I remember in a town in Texas close to one of those prisons. It's a sort of a, I'm leaving prison, prison, halfway out and halfway in. And they had a Sunday school class in this church. And I was visiting there. And they said to me, well, Fred, why don't you teach that class? They, they don't have a teacher, really. They just sort of do it themselves. And I said, well, they can do it themselves this Sunday. Well, sit in there. See what you think. Well, <laughs> they were reading the Bible. 
couldn't believe it really but they were they were reading the bible and they were in mark 5 you know about the fellow that uh, had all the demons and the demons went into the pigs and the pigs went into the sea and one of them read the text and there was total silence and someone said maybe if we had it in a different version so somebody read it in another version after about three versions uh, there was a person there whose life just looked all dissipated. And he just looked at that and looked at that and he said, Well, that's the damnedest thing I ever heard of. <laughs> and we started talking about it. And we were not talking about the demons and the pigs going into the sea. We were talking about ourselves, about demons and what this means. It was a, just an extraordinary class. They had one thing in common. Within six months, they were going to be out of prison. Now, surely we can find something that would cause every class, every congregation, to be such a healthy, healthy place as that. Of course, being a reverend myself, when he said, that's the damnedest thing, I flinched and said, tisk tisk. But... Uh, <laughs> It was so refreshing to me to hear such an open embrace and assimilation, application of Scripture. I am, uh, as I said, overwhelmed by what all you're doing. I passed, uh, and Nancy took me by several buildings, said we do this here and we do this here, and there's the clinic over there, and here's uh, wellness and prevention and healing and all that, you know, and just... Wow, it's happening right here. It's extraordinary. I commend you, all of you, who take advantage and contribute to this marvelous work. Is it of the church? Yes. Is it of a community? Yes. Is it of God? Absolutely no question. Thank you. Well, I think you would all agree it was worth coming for just for that. It was uh, truly uh, wonderful. Um, Fred's agreed to ask, answer a few questions, so uh, now's the time to ask. We've got uh, about, about five or ten minutes before our, our break, so I think probably anything is fair game. So uh, tr surely somebody has a question or... Go ahead. Could you speak a little more about the Steinbeck? Point of balance between the attitude of the total separation of faith and medical science and the uh, invalid claim by faith to control medical conditions. Well, I as you know, the complexity of a matter uh, lends itself to all kinds of distortions, and finding a balance is a very important question. Uh, I think if one takes your eye off of this extreme or this extreme and let the whole of life for yourself and for other people be a life before God and let God give the gifts of healing and health and saving and whatever, just to, to reorient instead of calculating and measuring. I'm, I'm nervous about the correlations that calculate or measure. I don't even think in those terms. Uh, just, uh, I was, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I, I am a firm believer in prayer, but I'm not a firm believer in people telling about what was an answer to prayer and what wasn't. I was once in, down in Alabama, stayed with a group after a church meeting, and they had a person at, sitting at the dining table of this home, there were about 20 people there, a person at the dining table with a sort of adding machine, and went around the room and people told what prayer they had answered that week, and they were tallied up. And I said, what are you all doing? 
They said, we're going to prove to everybody that God answers prayer. And the prayers, uh, there was a woman who had wanted a trip to Hawaii, and, and she and her husband had gone. And so that was clicked down there. And there was someone else that had gotten a new fur coat, and that was down there. And there was a young woman there that had always wanted a date with somebody named Mike, and he had asked her. Well, that was put on there. And when I was there, they had already over 200-something answers to prayer. I felt like a Philistine in my resistance to it, but I just couldn't believe that the calculation of answers to prayer uh, can be tallied that way. And they said to me, I said, I said to them, I said, I'm a little nervous about the ease and the facility of this calculating. I said, Jesus sweat, as it were, drops of blood in his prayer life. Falling on the ground and all like that. And we sit around here adding this stuff up while we're having cake and coffee. And stuff. There's something about this that doesn't fit me. Don't you believe in prayer? And I said, yes. Don't you believe God answers prayer? Yes. But I have to leave it somewhere. It's maybe a cop out. I admit it. But there is a mystery. There is that life, that beyond my ability to calculate before which I sit. And that is the God of providence and care and love. But for me to tally off how God does it, I, I haven't been able to. I just answer best I can by saying to reorient faith, if faith is toward God and believe that the blessings of that trust in the goodness of God are showered in ways we can't figure I'm going to take the privilege and ask you one question myself. Uh, a number of you may not realize that Fred had uh, the terrible experience of something called the Guillain-Barre syndrome, which meant that one day he's perfectly fine, that the next day he's totally paralyzed, and it's a, a life-threatening um, uh, problem. You, you may never walk again, and you may have chronic pain forever, and he continues to have um, some... Uh, sequela from that so but how have you in your own life dealt with such a out of the blue experience and and come to see faith and healing combined well it was a it, it was a shocking experience to have a disease that I'd never heard of and to be paralyzed in the DeKalb General Medical Center and the chaplains there came to see me with some regularity, and we talked about it. But there were two things, two or three things that worked in my favor, if I can put it that way. One was I, was, uh, I had chronic malaria as a child. I was always quarantined, or for years I was quarantined, lying there yellow, taking quinine and envying everybody playing. And I whined about my circumstance. And my father came into the room where I was bedded down and heard me whining. And he threw some books on the foot of the bed and said, Read, there is no way to modulate the human voice to make a whine acceptable. And read, <laughs> well, I did. I think it kind of toughened me up. There are other alternate ways to live. And when I was in the hospital, I was thinking of what part of my work I can continue in a wheelchair. And I thought that through. What part of my work I'll have to drop, so what will I pick up in its place? I thought that through. But frankly, uh, Dr. Morris, the main thing was I was 64, and I had never been ill. And I think that increased the shock but the shock was met with a sort of unexplained gratitude for all the years I'd had in good health. Not in the hospital, not on medicine, not anything. If I can have 64 years of such wondrous health, maybe it's my turn. I had prayer. The chaplains prayed for me. All of those things were factors. But I can't explain it any other way except I believed in the goodness of God that on the other side of this illness, I'll be doing something else in another way, but it'll still be in the service of God. 
And that's just kind of the way I looked at it. Werner? Yeah, by health, I mean that all aspects of our life together. For instance, Jesus dealt with social, mental, physical, moral or spiritual things, dealt with them all together. I think a healthy environment is when no part of anyone's life is closed off and private, hidden, concealed, embarrassing, shamed, whatever. But it is open to those who share in the life of the church. That is a healthy climate. For that church to know why Marilyn showed up that morning with tragedy in her family. For that church to have gone to her and expected her to be there would have been an extraordinary gesture. But it was not the case. My definition of health is that no part of our life together or the life of the individual is closed off, hidden, embarrassing, a place of shame. It can be openly shared in confidence and in love. Yeah. One more. Is there? Did you? Yeah. Well, yeah. Last question. More peacemaking. Yeah. Well, I don't think of peacemaking, peacemaking as a project or something that we just take on, but the development of all of our relationships so that the energy that's expended in the relationship, when that is broken, we move to that point. Peacemaking in the world is... Uh, Demonstrating the presence of Jesus in our lives together. I think the church can model what Jesus referred to as the realm of God. I think that is possible. And if we believe in God and the power of God, that expands. It's not isolated, insular. Don't let the world get in on you. Don't let the world do this. Be careful and watch out for the world. I don't, I don't see it that way at all. That your relationship to God and to the other person is one of peace. And when that is broken... You speak about it and you act about it with, with some real courage. Uh, the polarization in the congregations that I visit now is just unbelievable. How did we let that kind of sickness take over? This one woman, pastor of a large church in Washington, said, I can't preach anymore because they can't hear it. And I said, why, are you fussing at them? She said, no. But they have their antenna up so high just listening for one thing. Is he for or against the war? Is she for or against the war? Is she for or against the president? Is she for or against this? And they can't hear the good news. Now that church is going to take a lot of work. It can't make peace till it comes to be at peace with itself. And uh, that sounds too simple, but we have to start somewhere. But the main thing is not to isolate oneself from the world at large. For God so loved the world can't forget that. There's no area in the world that you can look. If you look carefully, you'll see the initials of the creator and the painter and the artist down in the row right-hand corner, G-O-D. In some of the ugliest scenes in the world, it's there. But we have to have courage. But here again, it's the way the clergy relates to the congregation. The fear of being dismissed, the fear of being fired, so I go tiptoeing around till I retire and said, boy, what I should have told them is, 
I shouldn't have told him anything. We should have worked it out gradually, gradually, gradually. That's not much of an answer, but that's my answer. Yeah.